about six hours from slamming into the East Coast. The tidal surge is ready to do some serious damage. And Atlantic City, New Jersey is expected to take a direct hit. In all, 50 million people live in the path of this huge storm. Let's kick things off right now with Chief Meteorologist Mike Carvey. Mike, no doubt about it, this is one dangerous storm. And it's a huge storm. I mean, the center of it is just getting to New Jersey right now. We've been feeling the effects for a number of hours, mm -hmm. heavy rain moving. And now, later tonight, we are really going to be feeling the big punch of winds that will be moving into the area. Hypercanes, how would they affect us? Well, let me start. Hypercanes are massive, colossal storms that can grow to the size of North America. Rain generated from them can flood an area of over 2,000 miles wide, and at one time, in over 20 feet of water generated storm surges of 100 feet high. Winds can generate over 500 miles an hour, which could literally destroy every man-made object today and rip up asphalt and scar the landscape. It would be like an EF5 tornado and the most powerful steroids imaginable. It would have the equivalent energy of a Hiroshima and Nagasaki blast every second for six straight months, assuming that hypercanes can live that short. They would make Hurricane Katrina look like a light drizzle in comparison. The size of this massive behemoth would make a typhoon tip and Hurricane Sandy look like a tiny dust devil in comparison. If Hypercane were formed in the Atlantic, even if it didn't make landfall, it could still devastate areas as far west as Cincinnati, Ohio, and it would produce temperature swings so great that snow in Chicago in July would fall, while the Falkland Islands near South America and Antarctica would bake in an 80 degree heat in the southern winter of July. Until the last 50 years or so, the thought of a tropical cyclone with winds beyond 200 miles per hour were thought to be all but impossible. But there were some cyclones that were thought to pass over the 200 mile per hour threshold. But that data collected on those storms were sketchy at best and skepticism plagued those reports. In 1958, Super Typhoon Ida had wind speeds of over 200 miles per hour. But in 1961, Super Typhoon Nancy was recorded to have 215 miles per hour sustained winds, but the instruments used to study this storm were considered unreliable by today's standards. In 1979, Typhoon Tip in the Western Pacific reached confirmed sustained winds of 190 miles per hour, but its pressure dipped to about 870 millibars, which made the most intense tropical cyclone in terms of barometric pressure in recorded history. In 1980, Hurricane Allen, which became the strongest hurricane in the Atlantic Basin with winds of 190 miles per hour, which was an equivalent to about an EF4 tornado. Fast forward to the 2015 Eastern Pacific hurricane season. Hurricane Patricia became the first verified storm in recorded history to reach wind speeds of over 200 miles per hour during one minute sustained interval. However, Less than six months later, it was learned that that hurricane actually had greater sustained wind speed of 215 miles per hour. That is unprecedented. And it was verified by NOAA. And it's speculation as to whether Patricia might have had a lower pressure than Typhoon Tip at a brief time in its existence, which is unprecedented at the time, making this the most intense storm in recorded history by wind speed. But it was an unprecedented El Nino season it surely was an El Nino to remember. To answer your question, for those of you who are watching this video, what is a hypercane? Well, let me tell you, a hypercane is a hypothetical class of extreme tropical cyclone that could form if ocean temperatures reached 50 degrees Celsius, which translates to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 15 degrees Celsius or 27 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the warmest ocean temperature ever recorded in human history. Such an intense increase in temperature would be caused by either a large asteroid impact, comet impact, or a large supervolcanic eruption, or an extensive global warming. There is some speculation that a series of hypercanes resulting from an impact by a large six mile wide asteroid 
contribute to the demise of the non non avian dinosaurs. This hypothesis was created by Carrie Emanuel of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who also coined the term hypercane. One thing about the Earth is that it's incredibly rare for storms to be so powerful that they scar the landscape. With the fear of climate change and the subsequent activity increasing from the sun, storm seasons are becoming increasingly unpredictable. In order to form a hypercane, according to Emmanuel's hypothetical model, the ocean temperatures would have to be at least 48 degrees Celsius, or 120 degrees Fahrenheit. A critical difference between a hypercane and present-day hurricanes is that a hypercane would extend into the upper stratosphere, that is, a towering cloud, whereas present-day hurricanes extend only into the lower stratosphere. Hypercanes could have wind speeds of over 800 kilometers per hour, that's over 500 miles per hour, and it would also have a central pressure of less than 70 kilopascals, which is roughly 700 millibars giving them an enormous lifespan. Such a storm would be eight times more powerful than the strongest storms ever recorded, including Hurricane Patricia. The extreme conditions needed to create a hypercane would conceivably produce a system up to the size of North America, extending from Greenland down to Panama, creating storm surges of over 59 feet with an eye wall roughly 300 kilometers wide, which in American terms is 190 miles across. The waters could remain hot enough for weeks, allowing for more hypercanes to form. A hypercane's clouds could reach 19 miles into the stratosphere. Such an intense storm would also damage Earth's ozone. Water molecules in the stratosphere would react to the ozone and accelerate the decay of O2, oxygen, breathable air, and reduce the absorption of ultraviolet light. This could cause severe burns to anyone exposed. But the unfortunate truth is that hypercanes, in which hurricanes would be so massive, their winds would be so great, you could imagine the most powerful EF5 tornado in history at 312 miles per hour but spanned over 2,000 miles wide and could travel hundreds of miles inland and still sustain winds of over 150 miles per hour at the edge of the storms before losing strength. That would be the best case scenario you could ever hope for if you were to be struck by a hypercane. If one were to hit the eastern seaboard, places like New York, Washington, Philadelphia, as far west as Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit, Indianapolis, Chicago would be affected. The devastation would be insurmountable. Coastal cities would be washed away. Nearly all man-made structures would be leveled. Trees would be torn to shreds and the, the asphalt and concrete roadways that we have built would be ripped up from the ground like ripping wax paper from the human skin. The entire eastern seaboard would be uninhabitable for years. That includes places like Ocean City and Myrtle Beach and Outer Banks and Miami, Florida. Life within a 2,000 mile swath of a hyperking would be extinguished. It would, no one would survive. If you not only were in the eye of this hypothetical hyperking and survive the 300 to 500 mile per hour winds and stinging rain, the UV radiation would certainly burn your skin because of the colossal storm wreaking havoc on the ozone layer that would normally protect you from UV radiation. A thousand miles of land affected by this massive storm has happened before, but not on such an extreme scale like a hypercane. Let's take for instance Superstorm Sandy in 2012. It was a hurricane that had tropical storm force winds that stretched over a thousand miles and affected areas from New York City to as far west as Green Bay, Wisconsin. That is unper- Now keep in mind, thousands of years from now, the sun will get brighter, and temperatures here on Earth will get hotter. This could make colossal storms like hypercanes seem more of the normal. Only structures made from reinforced 
carbon nanotubes or compressed boron nitrate nanotube structures could maybe, in theory, and I stress maybe, withstand speeds greater than 300 miles per hour. But the question arises, how could a hypercane form during our lifetime? Well, some possible theories might suggest a 100 megaton blast over the ocean near a low pressure system that would be forming or a large asteroid impact over the ocean close to a low pressure system forming or runaway greenhouse effect. One country in theory could use a giant mirror to direct sunlight to an area of the ocean of low wind shear near a low pressure system that would heat up the ocean just enough to create conditions just right for a hypothetical hypercane to form. This giant mirror would probably be assembled in space or like a solar sail would be thin and it would be compact when it was sent into orbit and stretch out after it was deployed. The only nations on earth that have this type of capability is France, India, China, Japan, and the United States and also Russia. A hurricane functions as a Carnot heat engine powered by temperature differences between the sea and the uppermost layer of the troposphere. As air is drawn in towards the eye, it acquires latent heat from evaporating seawater, which is then released as sensible heat during the rise inside the eye wall and radiated away from the top of the storm system. This energy input is balanced by energy dissipation and a turbulent boundary layer close to the surface, which leads to an energy balance equilibrium. However, in Emmanuel's model, the temperature difference between the sea and the top of the troposphere is too large in a hypothetical hypercane. There is no solution to the equilibrium equation. In this frightening scenario, as more air is drawn in, the released heat reduces the central pressure further. The lower the pressure, the more heat is drawn in, leading to a runaway process that could lead to the most massive storm ever seen on the planet Earth. This runaway heat effect would eventually deprive our atmosphere of warmth and eventually the temperature of the earth will drop. Eventually this hypercane will start to dissipate as temperatures drop. And when it does, and it would eventually follow with an ice age. Now, now let me explain why Emmanuel drew this model of a hypercane. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Then a rock about six miles long slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula and created a thermal shock which enveloped an area almost 2,000 miles wide in diameter. The Gulf of Mexico would have been heated to the point where water literally boiled away. But once the dust settled and hurricanes that once formed over the oceans fed on the soupy waters from that impact and which was about around 120 degrees Fahrenheit, conditions for a hypercane was created. The size of this hypercane would probably envelop an area the size of North America and have a barometric pressure of about 700 millibars. Wind speeds in excess of 500 miles per hour, which would be the result of this hypercane making landfall and traveling the earth would destroy all unprotected life. It is possible that the ocean could remain warm for years after impact as well, resulting in more hypercanes to form, but I believe that this might have contributed to the dinosaur's extinction. Now fast forward to about 70,000 years ago. 70,000 years ago, in Indonesia, lied a lake called Lake Toba. Under Lake Toba was a supervolcano, which had enough magma to fill up Lake Superior in the United States. Think about that one. Now think about this. 70,000 years ago, Lake Toba erupted and it ejected more ash than Mount St. Helens ever did. And also Tambora and Krakatoa all combined and still have more ash to throw. Now 
when Lake Toba erupted, it erupted with a force of 1,000 times more powerful than the most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated by man, the Tsar Bomb, which was 50 megatons. Now using that math, 50 megatons times 1,000 would equal 50,000 megatons, or about 50 gigatons of TNT from Lake Toba. That is a lot of energy. Lake Toba was directly responsible for the bottleneck of human population at the time. The resulting eruption, which was believed to have occurred during the northern summer monsoon season, generated a massive mega tsunami, which wiped out islands and civilizations that colonized those islands at the time. And it created conditions where the water in the South Pacific and Indian Oceans were so warm that immensely powerful tropical cyclones formed. These behemoths grew so large that it flooded areas with over 20 feet of rain in one area alone and created tidal waves almost 70 feet high and devastated areas the size of North America. These storms could be the origin of the flood narratives of the Abrahamic religions as well as other religions around the world including Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Hinduism. The Epic of Gilgamesh also explains this as well. One thing is for certain, hypercanes are incredibly rare. They may be hundreds of times more powerful than super typhoons like Tip and Heian, but they are also a hundred times more rare than those super typhoons. A hypercane is thought to occur maybe once every 70,000 years, but I stress maybe, with the last one occurring during the Lake Toba super eruption. Now one thing is to be made clear about hypercanes. This is just one hypothetical scenario. If one were to occur in 2017 in the summer, let's say an asteroid would impact an area near Cuba, it would wipe out Havana. This asteroid would probably be close to about 500 feet long and it would devastate the entire country with effects reaching far into Florida and as far south as Venezuela. Now it would be in the summer and think about after this impact a low pressure system formed in the Caribbean. When it forms and it would go over this region where the impact occurred the ocean would be so heated it would form this gigantic massive and colossal storm unheard of in recorded human history that it would devastate all of the islands in the Caribbean and it would grow so large that places like Miami, Tampa Bay and as far west as Cozumel, Mexico and as far east as Bermuda because this storm would get so massive it would be over 2,000 miles wide West Virginia and Pennsylvania like Pittsburgh and Erie and Charleston and Hagerstown, Maryland and Baltimore and Washington DC, Philadelphia, Atlantic City, Ocean City, New York City, Buffalo would all be completely destroyed and the forests around the area of the Appalachians up until the coast would be completely leveled. All the trees would be blown far away and then there would be nothing left but a scarred landscape wasteland. It would be uninhabitable for years. Devastation would be so great that it could cost nearly a hundred million lives and it would also cost trillions of dollars in damages. It would take humanity decades to rebuild as infrastructure would be completely devastated. Electricity to the entire region would be cut off. It would be so destructive that you couldn't possibly imagine anyone surviving this devastated region. But one thing is for sure, that this is just one scenario that could happen if an asteroid would impact the Earth. We could be looking at other things such as global warming or a super volcanic eruption. Those could also happen as well and could cause a hypercane to form. But using that and using these that I have mentioned, you could picture the kind of devastation that these would bring. The point I'm trying to make is that if something were to happen here on Earth to us, that 
we would be extinct and nothing of us would remain. Even Stephen Hawking has said that if we don't colonize other worlds within a thousand years, our civilization would be extinct by that time. That is why we should colonize other worlds and other stars before that thousand years is up because within that thousand years, anything could happen. A hypercane, a super volcano, an asteroid impact, or nuclear devastation could wipe us out in an instant. Thank you for watching this video and thank you for subscribing. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to this channel and keep up to date on the latest documentaries and videos posted by me, Iron Tusk 341 If you want to stay up to date on your mobile phone whenever I upload a new video, click the bell on there and be, you could be alerted to my next video. You can also support me on Patreon as well. The link will be in the description below. Also, I'd like to thank Kerry Emanuel from MIT as well for pitching the idea of hypercanes to the Republic. Without him, this video would not be possible. But thank you all for watching as well.